Hello, my name is Matthew, and I am with the Florida Library Association Professional Development Committee and Leadership Subcommittee. We are doing this series on productivity, and we are overjoyed to talk with Dr. Leo Lowe. Uh, Dr. Lowe is the Dean of the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences for the University of New Mexico. So I'm going to turn my webcam off so that we can hear from Dr. Lowe. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. So hello, everyone. My name is Leo Lowe. I, um, so a little bit about my background before I have jump into um, what we want to talk about productivity today. So I got my MLIS from Florida State University in 2008. And I started my um, librarianship career at Kansas State University after I graduated. So, and very soon I, uh, I realized that I was quite interested in the leadership and management of libraries rather than you know being a subject librarian which was interesting enough but uh, but I, after i realized that i was more interested in the administrative side of things i kind of set my career path in with that in mind so i later became the department head uh, of the education library at the university of alabama and then associate university librarian at old dominion university and then associate dean at penn state university libraries and now I'm at University of New Mexico um, as the Dean of the College of University Libraries and Learning Sciences. Uh, so UNM is the flagship university in New Mexico, and it is a R1 research university with about um, 21,000 uh, students total. So the university libraries here is a little bit unusual in that it is part of a college, which also includes the university press and a learning sciences degree granting program, which is so, uh, it's, it is a college, so it's a slightly different than uh, a regular university library. And I oversee all three units with about 130-ish uh, employees doing very different roles. Um, so that's kind of the background, um, um, my own background and where I work. So I was um, asked to share some you know, strategies and tools to maintain and develop, develop uh, productivity. So when, when people talk about productivity, I, I see a lot of, kind of productivity hacks out there, like using a particular app uh, or segment your workday into you know, 20 minutes blocks or don't reply to emails as they, as they come in, you know, batch reply them to minimize distraction or you know, mode switching. And many of them are great. You know, I've used you know a lot of these techniques uh, as well in my life. But when I think about how to maintain and and develop productivity, uh, I think the most important thing for me is to know why you're doing what you do. And maybe we can cut, break it down a little bit. You know, I think that being productive is a combination of being effective and efficient. So. If we kind of define if effectiveness and efficiency as effectiveness is, is doing the right things, while efficiency is doing things right, then you know productivity is you know the intersection of those two things basically, and a lot of the, the techniques out there tend to teach you how to be efficient, how to really take advantage of you know using time, which is great. But how can we add effectiveness to them to become productive? So for, so for me, it's kind of like knowing what your bigger goals are, you know, having a vision. What do you want, actually want to accomplish in the long term? So without that long term vision, we can kind of churn out task after task. And maybe that's OK for a very entry level job, but for most of what we do nowadays it requires some level of independent judgment of prioritizing. You know, like I'm sure you have felt uh, very busy, but not very productive sometimes. And that's kind of when we're in that kind of mindless robotic kind of mindset, we just deal with whatever is in front of us without really stopping and kind of thinking about what are the most you know, in, impactful tasks that you know we should do first and spend the most time on so i'm a very goal oriented person so I, I think about this a lot and we all have you know limited time limited energy so it's really important to to prioritize um, you've probably heard of the 80 20 rule you know 80 percent of the outcomes or the outputs come from 20 percent of the inputs 
So certain inputs are more valuable than others or more impactful than others. And it's, it's hard to figure out the 20% that's the most impactful without knowing your long-term goals. So for the library, that's the strategic plan. As a leader, it's our job to keep reminding people of the priorities of the, of the library. It's our job to, to guide the units and individuals to develop their own version of strategic plan. So everyone knows what are the most important things they can do to help themselves, uh, their units, the library and the university to achieve the, you know, the bigger goals. And you might think, what, create your own strategic plan? That, that sounds ridiculous. And I think a lot of people are not particularly fond of strategic planning. Uh, but let me share a very short story that, that profoundly um, changed my life. So when I turned 40 years old, I came up with 45 life goals to accomplish, kind of like a bucket list of things that I want to accomplish in my life. So that project, I called it 45 before 45 project. And it's amazing that what, it can help you do how you can help focus your energy when you have specific things in mind that you that you know you have to do these are the things that i want to accomplish to make myself into the person i have won, always wanted to be right so there are different you know areas like travel the world you know learn things career-wise how get a promotion you know get tenure and other things like that so when you have these kind of articulated and kind of lay out, you have these in front of you for five years, basically, You've, it focuses you to do things that will help you achieve those goals. And that's really, I think, where productivity comes in is to know what you actually want to accomplish in the long term. Um, but in terms of my kind of day-to-day -day routines, I, I have a kind of to-do list, but it's Sometimes it can get really long, but I always put the most important, like three things at the very top that I need to accomplish these must do things today. And the other things are less important. If I have time, I'll do them. If I don't, well, they can wait another day, basically. And um, I talk about, you know, being a leader, kind of articulating the strategic plan or reminding people. And that's, I try to do that with communication. Every, but every organization says if there's not enough communication and I recognize that. And I try to do as much as possible. So since I became the Dean at my college, I would hold a monthly all college meeting for different units to share what they're doing. So everybody kind of gets a sense of how oh, other people are doing these things to achieve the bigger goals. How can we kind of work together or you know, kind of inspire them to do their to their, to do their parts as well? Another thing is I, I have a weekly uh, um, email message that I send out on every Friday. So today I'm, I'll be writing mine later, which is really just to share what I've been doing. And kind of we enforce, you know, some of the most important things for us. For for example, for my college, the big thing is open educational resources right now. And I'll keep reminding people: these are some of the things I'm doing. How you can, you know, do your part to make that a priority for your unit, for example. Um, so these are some of the things that we we try to do here to um, to work as a team to kind of have aligned goals and um, be transparent about you know, what we're doing and get people involved in the decision-making because we all know what are the priorities. Then it's easier to, to kind of you know, say, I'm making this decision because of this. Um, so that, those are the, the things that I consider important in terms of uh, increasing productivity. But one, one of the most important things I've learned over the years is to get enough sleep. Uh, I, everybody needs different hours of sleep, you know, find, find out yours. Uh, for me, it's eight hours. Uh, so I need at least eight hours of sleep. So no matter what, get that amount. And, and I think you, you, you be a lot more productive that way. So thank you very much. All right. Uh, yeah, I have to laugh at that sleep thing because we've all been there because we want to clone ourselves and we want to figure it out. And sometimes we just have to stay up and do it, but, but it affects, right? It affects your productivity oh, yeah. the following day. And I think it's so interesting that you bring up the idea of alignment 
because oftentimes we experience things in organizations where at, we're at odds with each other. Um, and we feel like maybe we're siloed or we're alone or we don't understand each other's priorities. And so we end up maybe doing more on something that when, than we should. When other people might want to participate, they might want to support it, or they might have solutions you're not aware of. And so from a leadership perspective, I think that's very helpful for me to hear uh, as a learning leader, because um, the idea of communicating on a regular basis in multiple ways and, uh, and making sure that your, your strategic plan as well as the organization's strategic plan, you know, have something to do with each other and making those connections so that if you're aligning with other departments and other people, you know, in your sphere, maybe it won't be quite so hard to get things done. And, and that from a productivity standpoint, it goes well beyond the idea of closing out email and, and uh, you know, sort of the simple, the things that you mentioned at the beginning, the simple thing, the tricks that you can kind of apply. Um, and so that's very helpful. That's very helpful advice. I really appreciate you sharing that today. Thank you. Um, I want to get back to one. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question. And mm -hmm. I want to uh, get to, back to the idea of um, perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you didn't quite use that word, but I think there was sort of a, a nod in that direction because you have efficiency and effectiveness and the efficiency has to do with getting things done. But of course, we, especially in the library world, we oftentimes are obsessive about getting it right, whether it's wordsmithing or yeah. making sure we're using the proper rationale or like evidence-based this or that, or right. building on precedent or whatever the case might be. Um, but it really can't be perfect, can it, in all instances? No, we really cannot. I, that's one thing, one important lesson I've learned, kept rising up the rank in terms of making decisions. I mean, we all want, you know, all the information we have to make decisions, but the fact is we don't, we never do. And with COVID, that's the, you know, that's a perfect example is that things change every day. We never have enough information, enough data to make those evidence-based, you know, decisions that we, we want to do ideally. So what we can do is we have a very adaptive mindset, be kind of, you know, I think every, all the things I tried here, I, and I use the word try, is that I emphasize that word. We're trying this. If it doesn't work, we can always modify. We evaluate in, and modify things as, as we move forward. Otherwise, we'll never go anywhere because we can never get everything ready and prep, you know, the way we, you know, want it to be. So uh, I think that the tech world has it right, just beta, you know, prototype everything. And just, you know, it's, it's a moving cup. Uh, uh, object, you know, we, we keep move, uh, live. the strategic plan is a living document and we can keep making changes to, to it. And that's what I would, you know, um, suggest people, you know, adopt that mindset. Otherwise, I mean, they would never move forward basically. Well, Dr. Leola, we could talk to you uh, all day, but that would not be very efficient. Uh, and are very productive for any of us. So I just wanna thank you very much on behalf of FLA for helping us with this topic, explore this topic of productivity. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So welcome everyone. I'm Amy Harris and I'm here with Doug Crane. He's going to be speaking to us today about productivity. And Doug, would you give us a brief introduction? I'd be glad to. Uh, so my name is Doug Crane. I have the honor of being the director for the Palm Beach County Library System down here in beautiful Southeast Florida. I've been the director for almost eight years now. However, I've worked with the system for the last 24 years in numerous positions, including as a children's librarian, a branch manager, and a division head. I have been teaching classes on productivity and efficiency for over a decade. And my classes have been done locally here in Palm Beach County, also across Florida, and even nationally um, for groups like PLA and ALA. So I've had a wide range of experience and excitement around productivity. In fact, I blog on the topic through my website, efficientlibrarian.com. Would you share some uh, strategies and tools that you use for workflow productivity? Okay, excellent. Yes, I'd like to. My, my interest in productivity started 
back in about 2011, when walking through my library, I came across David Allen's book, Getting Things Done. Little did I know that it was an international bestseller that has transformed the lives of millions of knowledge workers around the world to help them become more productive and more efficient. And it was one of those books that when I picked it up, it just, you know, I felt like it was written for me. It was exactly what I needed at that time to get my workflow and my uh, workplace situation a lot better, a lot more under control. I was got my inbox emptied out. I cleared off my desk. I was able to do things much more efficiently. And I, and I was able to keep track of everything that was of interest to me. So it's certainly something I tell people that without the principles of getting things done or GTD, as it is known to its adherents, that if I didn't have that skill set, I wouldn't be able to be the successful director I am today. So I think the best thing to share is David Allen's concept of workflow, because for me, understanding how things came into my world and how I processed them and got them out into actionable, um, actionable items was really very important. So let me go over the GTD five stages of workflow, because I think this will help everyone listening get a better idea of how work comes in and how to structure what are the components of successful workflow. You see, for a lot of people, when they get there as a knowledge worker, and I'll just define that quickly, a knowledge worker is basically someone who comes in to their workplace and has to figure out their job. They have to figure out what success looks like. This is the opposite of a task worker who basically shows up and someone else tells them how to do the work and someone else tells them when they're done. A lot of work that we do in libraries, there's not really like a, a, a beginning and end to it, right? There's a lot of things that we do that it's never very clear, is this good enough? Is this done? And, you know, No clear situations. Oftentimes things just kind of meld one into the other. The thing is though, what the GTD process does, and especially looking at the stages of workflow, is it helps define the work down. In fact, one of David Allen's sayings is, one of your role, primary role as knowledge workers to define your work. That is to decide what exactly it is you're going to do, what success looks like, and then to take the necessary actions to complete that particular project or assignment. So when David Allen kind of studied and looked at how we do work, he essentially broke it down into five distinct stages. These were capture, clarify, organize, reflect, and engage. So let me break those steps down because each step has its own best practices. The first step of any knowledge worker is capturing input, capturing information. You know, as things come to our awareness, we need tools and techniques to be able to take hold of it. And a lot of these are kind of rebuilt, pre-built for you. There are things like email is a way that we capture information. Your inbox on your desk is one way you capture information. Taking notes is a way to capture information. All these things are ways that when something's out there in the world, we get a hold of it. Unfortunately, what David Allen's found, and I know is true in my life, is a lot of people try and just capture things only using their head. And I don't know about you, but I've forgotten things. You know, and it doesn't take long to forget something. I'm sure you've all had that experience where you have something important you're gonna do, you step out your door and then something shiny distracts you and you've completely forgotten about it. The key is you gotta capture it in a way that is outside of your head in some system where you don't have to remember it, but you, all you have to remember is to know where to go to find it. Big difference. So if you ever talk to someone and they say, oh yeah, don't worry, I'll remember that. Treat that with a heavy dose of skepticism. <laughs> if they pull out their phone and they say, let me mark that down, you know it's more likely to have been captured. And our inputs come in all different ways. So being very mindful about capturing stuff that comes in is extremely important. Now, just capturing stuff alone is not enough. That's only the first step. Once you've captured things, you have to clarify what they mean to you, right? Is this stuff that I captured of interest? Is it helpful? Is it just trash? You know, think about your email inbox. You capture a lot of email comes to you. 
But I'll tell you right now, over half your email doesn't have much value to it. It's either trashable or at best, potentially reference that you might put away. There's only a very slim sliver of input that comes to us that is directly useful to what we're trying to do. So as a knowledge worker, we have to go through and basically triage our different inboxes that we've captured things in to decide what's useful, what can be decided, what can be done, and get a clear sense of whether there's an action associated with that. You see, when you're looking at your inbox, there's two key questions you have to ask yourself. The first is, what is it? Identify what the actual piece of input, whether it's an email message, uh, memo, what it actually means. What is it trying to say? The second step is to decide, you know, is it actionable? Now, by actionable, it means is there something you need to directly do as a response? If the answer is no, there's nothing you need to do with it, then all you have left to do is dispose of that particular piece of input that came in. And you can either trash it or file it away. However, if the action's yes, if it says yes, there's something you need to do an actual action to take it, the next question is, what is the next action? That is, what's the next physical thing you need to do to move this forward? And this is where a lot of projects get hung up because people realize there's something they need to do, but they don't take the extra step to decide what that physical action is, right? And it's important to define it as a physical action because someone needs to be able to see you doing it, whether that's typing an email, you know, writing a note, talking to a friend, picking up the phone, doing something that someone could see you do. A lot of times people say, well, let me think about it. Now, there are ways to think about it, but some of the best ways to think about it are getting it out of your head by mind mapping or making notes or doing something artistic or whatever, something with your hands to get it out. Uh, sometimes when people really say, I want to think about it, all they mean is that I hope it goes away. <laughs> and I don't have to think about it. So when you decide what the next physical action is, you have to store a reminder of what that next physical action is. And this is where a lot of people fall down because they think they can remember it all in their head. But again, uh, David Allen actually says have, that your head is a crappy office space because it's easy to forget. So you need to have a structured format. And this is where the organized step comes in at the five stages of workflow. You have to have little parking areas to put these things here, 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 here. And that typically one way to do that is through the use of different folders. And these can be physical folders like I have in my hand here, or they could be email folders, electronic folders, et cetera. But there are several different types. Uh, and the key ones for organizing are first an action folder. This is where after you've triaged your email, found out what you actually have to do, you wanna put that next action reminder into your action folder. And you can create the action folder in your email or make a physical folder. The next, and basically that folder sits there until you have discretionary time to do stuff, then you pull it out and you look at it and you decide what's the most important thing or what's the best thing or the simplest thing I can do right now out of that smaller list. Because if you were to leave all this in your inbox, you have to go through everything in there. That just wastes time. A couple other folders I'll share that David Allen recommends. One is a waiting for folder. This what did is I when accomplish? You what delegate an action to someone else. You know, a lot of actions trying to collect that come to everything us all at once are things and that we don't do ourselves, do we, but we have someone do do else do for us. Whether it's you know, you send it to finance, send it to IT, send it to you know another division because that's the one that processes it. Well, if we don't keep track of what we've delegated out, the item could fall through the cracks, especially if the other person's not responsive. So. Having a waiting for folder is where you keep a note of what you've delegated out so you can keep track. And if it hasn't come back yet, you've got a system to remind yourself to go and, and poke those people. Say, hey, come on, I need an answer. Another type of folder is a someday maybe folder. I also call it the good idea folder. Because you know when you're thinking about stuff, we get lots of great ideas about things, but not necessarily when and where and the right time to use it. You know, if you've got a great idea for a new 
project that's going to renovate your library. The problem is, in order to do something like that, you probably need a budget, you probably need approval, you probably need to do some research, you probably need to do a whole bunch of other steps. You can't do some of those right now. In fact, if it's a, something for the budget process, that may only be certain windows of the month where you can move that forward. So creating a waiting for folders where you can drop good ideas, or you know, if you get good ideas from a newsletter. You might think, wow, that's great, a culinary kitchen in the library, awesome. I'm not ready to do anything with that yet, but I don't wanna lose it. Well, just park that newsletter in the, someday maybe, and then when you got some time, and maybe the appropriate time, you can go back and do something with it. And then of course, for organization, you also need to keep track of material that you're keeping for reference. Now, what unfortunately happens is a lot of times people keep the reference material on any open surface around them, <laughs> the classic messy office. You don't wanna do that. It's not a good system. It looks ugly, easy to lose stuff. For physical things, you need to just keep a good set of file folders, A to Z by subject, one subject per folder, keep it lean, purge it regularly, and it will be an effective tool for you. Electronically, I often advise people to have just one archive or reference folder and work on power searching that way. Simply because if you try to create too many folders in email, it's not as easy to park them and you don't need to because you have the power searching tools. If you just have one spot to put it, you'll put it there. Okay, so we've covered capture, clarify, organize. There's two other stages to workflow. The next is reflect. That is, every time you set up a system or a systematic approach to something, you need to spend a little bit of time on maintenance. That is to go back and make sure the system is working effectively. So GTD recommends a, David Allen, the GTD creator recommends a weekly review. That is at one point in the week, typically towards the end of your work week, you go through your folders, you look at your, what you've done, you look at your calendar and make sure you're up to date. And this is a good thing to do at the end of the week. That way you can go into your weekend feeling good and that everything you need to do on Monday is going to wait for you nicely packaged on Monday. So if you don't do a weekly review, what can happen is things can be in the wrong spot and you stop trusting the system. And then you just fall to trying to remember things in your head, which just adds extra layers of stress. So just like anything, you know, you need to take your car in and get the oil changed, the tires rotated, et cetera, regularly if you want it to run. Well, you got to take a little bit of time once a week or so to ensure your system's good. Final stage of workflow is engage. That is, once you've captured everything, clarified what it means to you, organized what's actionable and what's not, then you got to engage with it. You got to actually take those physical actions you said you needed to do and keep track of the projects that you have underway. By engaging, this is where we're mindfully saying, what's the best thing I can do at any given time? Because there might, there's every different, there are many different ways to prioritize your work. The challenge is one priority system might not be the best thing for any given time, right? To say what's most important, well, you know, if you only have five minutes, doing something that takes less than five minutes to do is going to be more productive than trying to work on a piece of something that'll be an hour or two hours. On the other hand, if you've got a firm deadline, you got to get it done by five. Well, guess what? That's probably your more pressing priority. And that's where part of the art and science of workflow management comes into play. And that's where people really start developing and upping their games. What's going to give me the best bang for the buck at any given time, at any given spot, based on my energy level, based on my commitments, based on the time allowed. So all that, that's the five stages of workflow. Once you get through all that, hey, you've accomplished a lot. Do you have any questions regarding that, Amy? I do. Um, one of the things that I hear about the GTD system is that the most common hangup seems to be that weekly review. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips for helping uh, people be consistent in that? Oh yeah, that's a huge thing. In fact, David Allen 
has been quoted as saying that the people who keep up a regular weekly review, keep their system going. Those who don't find the system collapse and they stop using it. So to do a weekly review, the best thing, one of the best ways to do that is to identify a time on your calendar and mark it off as just private time for yourself for the review. And don't let anyone else come in. It's a sacred meeting, just like if you had set a meeting with your boss, you're not gonna let anyone else take it, move it. You set that time up and you, you dedicate it to your own thing. So usually if you're doing a Monday through Friday, set it up on the Friday before or after lunch. That way you still have some you know, mental capacity, you still have some interest and people will still be around in case you need to reach out to them. Give yourself an hour or two, depending on what your workload is like, lock it into the calendar and then just commit to doing it. In fact, on the Getting Things Done website, you can find uh, tips and tricks on how to do the weekly review. There's, they have whole articles out there that give the best practices for it. And of course, in the book itself, you can find those best practices also. Uh, and essentially it's a three piece process. It's make sure you clear out whatever there is when you start the weekly review. So make sure you clear out the inbox if there's anything left over, make sure things are in order. And then you simply go through every, you go through your action folder, go through your waiting for folder, look at your calendar, see where you've been over the past two weeks, look ahead, see where you're going and see if there's any actions that might be coming up that you need to capture to move forward. Then after that, you have time to be creative, look in the someday maybe folder for the good ideas, see what's there. Part of it is just that regular practice. So, and a lot of that is getting it on your calendar and refusing to allow that time to be taken over by something else. That sounds good, thank you. Um, do you have any examples of where um, you've helped somebody uh, use this system uh, and, and they've really had a turnaround with it? Oh yeah, I've had many success stories. Uh, it's quite remarkable when I hear about people who've used the system and come back and they're just flying with it, you know, flying with it. Uh, you know, one of the very first success stories I had was when early on when I was still a manager, I was just starting to teach people this system. And I was working with my building supervisors and there was one supervisor, my my head of circulation. And I actually sat down with her at her desk and went through and set up the whole system, helped her clear out her backlog. And this was over a two hour period. And it was, it was stressful for her, I could tell. She was getting a little stressed. But when we were finished, she looked at me and said, I just feel so good now because you know I'm retiring in a few years and I was afraid of like, what was I gonna leave behind for my successor? But now I know I'm only gonna be able, I'm gonna just leave behind what's important. And she became one of the biggest vocal uh, proponents of the system in the branch. Uh, another great success story I had was of a gentleman who worked for our parks and recs department. He was a supervisor, tended to be out in the field a lot, but he had an office. And he came to one of my half day workshops. And I often invite people, hey, go ahead and send me a before and after photo if you go back and you start implementing this. Well, he sent me back one a few weeks later. He had gone to his office on a weekend when no one was around. And he worked for about eight hours to clear out you know, a decade or more of backlog. Get it clear, get it concise. And he just told me, wow, my, my world's changed here. I just feel like now I know what's important. I know what I need to do. Uh, it was just phenomenal to see someone like dedicate that time to get the space clear. Uh, and I'll, I guess I'll share one more story. Uh, this one's maybe a, a little, well, a few years back, I did this workshop for the Palm Beach County United Way. And I went in on a staff day and I did the training. And one of the jokes that I do, one of the things I get people to get excited about clearing out their inbox, for example, is if you clear it out, you're supposed to go, yes, woo, do a big celebration every time you clear your inbox. Uh, I thought, and I, I, not when I, I use the word bam, I went bam. And sure enough, uh, I got a feedback a few weeks later to say that all throughout the United Way office for the next few weeks, they would hear people going bam, 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 because they cleared out their inbox. And it just showed like the impact that, you know, 
people, they look at productivity and efficiency and they think it's either a geeky thing or, oh, it's going to be a boring thing. You know, it's just some tips or tricks. But really, it can be very life changing. It can really free up a lot of space to be able to pay attention to things that are more important and to be able to advance up and do more and accomplish more. Or at least even, or even the biggest thing I've heard is people say, look, you know, now that I have my work at the office under control, I don't take it home with me at night. I don't take it home with me on the weekend. Because if you care about your work-life balance, the more you can keep one in one place and the other in the other place, the easier your life will be. So those are just a few examples of, of some of the impact that I've heard back. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. Um, and I will put your website uh, on the end of the video so that if anyone wants to go see that, they can go see uh, your blog and what you've already written on that. Thank you for sharing with the Florida Library Association. And I appreciate your time. OK, well, thank you very much. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. My name is Rosal Dominguez, and I have the honor of presenting Dr. Vanessa Reyes as the next presenter in our panel. Dr. Vanessa Reyes is an assistant professor of instruction for the School of Information at the University of South Florida. She holds a PhD in Library and Information Science from Simmons College, an MS in Library and Information Studies from Florida State University, and a BA in English from Florida International University, which is where I work. So I'm really happy to have one of our alumni on. Dr. Reyes has worked in archives, legislative, university, and public libraries, and she contributes to the emerging field of personal information management, PAM, quantifying how individual users are organizing, managing, and preserving digital information. And so with that, I will let Dr. Reyes take over and share her knowledge when it comes to just managing all the stuff that one needs to get done in a day. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction, Grissel. It is an honor to be here to present in this panel for the FLA conference, leading your team to productivity. Uh, today, I'm gonna present strategies for practitioners and academics in the information profession coming from both uh, the practical end and the academic end. I hope that you find my suggestions helpful. The first thing I'm gonna do is tell you a little bit about the organization of this presentation. Part one of the presentation is gonna focus on accountability. And then I'm gonna talk about productivity and collaboration because I've seen that it's such an important area. Go through that and explain a little bit more about what's worked for me. First of all, what is productivity? So my research area is on personal information management as Grisel mentioned, and I focus on how users manage uh, save, preserve their personal information. And I notice that I'm most productive when I keep my stuff organized. And I just wanted to get that out of the way and show you what a sample desktop looks like for me. Um, I have divided um, my work into different compartments and categories, as you would say, um, a personal end of things of where I keep stuff, work-related stuff, things I'm working on, if I'm blogging something, miscellaneous, things that just don't fit a category. I have found that this has really worked for me in terms of managing my workflows and in the different personas that I have. So I have the persona of an educator, the persona of a researcher, the persona of a committee member, the persona of an academic advisor. So all these different things really start to get you to think, how am I going to be productive? Well, let's think about how the American Library Association is um, identifying productivity. It looks like productivity as an investment, right, as a business output. You know, when we're most productive, our businesses are most successful. Um, a company is minimizing input and maximizing output. They really have the highest productivity. Um, looking at productivity in terms of efficiency within an organization is so important, especially when it comes down to narrowing it down to each individual. When you start to look at the individual, you start to really analyze how is it that their contribution makes a difference to that organization, the decision making process. Um, so productivity really plays a huge role in all of this and really makes us think from all angles from sales from usability, 
the uh, way that patrons um, and uh, librarians have this exchange, this trust. So, um, so I'm going to go through all of that and provide some um, advice to uh, many of you who might want to learn more about these different areas. So I want to start with strategies, strategies for practitioners um, to achieve productivity through accountability. So to achieve accountability, I have found that you have to create a path, right? You have to create a path that's clear, that creates this plan of what I want to do. And you think about prioritizing, you think about the direct impacts, right? What are the direct impacts to your patrons, to your colleagues, to yourself? Putting yourself first in terms of your goals is important because as the golden rule says, if you can't help yourself, you can't really help others and you have to be able to um, have this sense of, am I really focused? What's creating a distraction? Am I overcommitted? And as an academic and a researcher and a, and, a, and a teaching faculty member, I find myself um, asking myself these questions constantly when I take on new projects, when I am working with students, when I am adding on other, other responsibilities to what I do. And then is your stuff organized? It really comes back to also how you keep track of everything. And um, it's the beauty also of, of being able to study human information behavior and looking at how users manage their day-to-day -day through digital formats, digital files, content. We're living in an era right now where we just have an over um, overload of digital content that is related to the things that we do and the personas that we need in our day-to-day. -day. We just have so much that we're keeping. So thinking about this, how are we keeping ourselves accountable, right? So to be productive, we have to keep accountable of our plans, our goals, avoiding distractions of digital um, digital media. There's so many distractions that I can think of just from the three different um, platforms I'm showing here. You have a phone, you have different tablets, you have your computers. Um, we are definitely living in an era of distraction and that is very difficult to maintain productivity, especially when we're trying to achieve so many things at once. So we're also in that multitasking uh, you know, era also, and I see it in my students, I see it in my colleagues, I see it all over, and it doesn't matter what um, discipline we're in, right? It, it's, it's actually quite common, and it's um, affecting everyone. Staying accountable is important as an information professional, because I mentioned, it goes back to what does, how does your actions affect others? So in, in the information profession, you are a team, you work together, you work together so that you can achieve one goal, disseminating information organization, you're trying to uh, produce uh, so much um, output in terms of uh, media information organization, um, programming, there's so much that is there, and you have to rely on one another. So how do you, how do you, how do you stay accountable communication? extra planning as an educator. You make a plan of a plan of a plan and then there's always feedback involved in every step of the way. When you're you know, planning a course, you have all these different evaluations that you take into consideration. That's a way of holding yourself accountable, both in information profession, both as an educator, as a researcher, as a student evaluation. Evaluation is really important, especially evaluation of self. And I'm gonna say that a lot because we often don't want to evaluate ourselves. I have to become, I have to think about what ways I can sustain productivity and I achieve that through keeping accountable, through making sure that I am communicative, that I am, um, observing and evaluating my own actions as they do impact everything down the line, everyone down the line, and it uh, impacts directly to that one goal, which is what your users, your students, the services that you're providing, that tangible goal that you want to achieve, that publication, that sustainable impact you want to make in the field. Um, so um, all of that really goes hand in hand. And then 
uh, how to stay accountable, right? Like that's that's the biggest uh, problem that we just can't really we can't really get a hold of our plans, and we see ourselves we are overcommitted and we're tired and. We've got so much going on and the past two years have been really difficult for all of us. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't read it best in the state of America's libraries where our librarians have been reassigned and they have been in, they have been doing beyond, uh, you know, what information professionals normally do. So what happens, right, when you are set to do, what, you know, your day to day is interrupted is affected you have external factors setting in what do we do so we go back to the basics we i i you know research has shown uh writing things down really sticks to memory um i'm quite a traditionalist when it comes to that um i love using digital tools calendars uh alarms uh constant reminders, digital sticky notes. I, I, I've i tried it all, but it really does help when you visualize your goals. Canva is such a great tool. Design your visions there that you want to achieve. I think the best way also to hold yourself accountable and make sure that you're being productive is tell a colleague about what you're doing and see if you can have them peer review and, and agree to be accountability buddies. And I use that term a lot because I have a few accountability buddies and one of them happens to be abroad in the UK. We've been working on research projects for the past seven, seven years now. And, um, and I've noticed that we have both, uh, you know, created these schedules that work for us and we always check in on each other, no matter the project, even if it's not our collaborative project at the moment, it could just be, you know, what are you working on? Are you, are you meeting your goals? Do you need someone to review something? And I think another aspect of this is also seizing the goal and being decisive, you know, deciding what you want and having that be something that you want to obtain and move forward with. Another thing that I've always seen is I've, I've already mentioned, you know, evaluation, but evaluating your progress. You know, if you have a rubric in your own department that discusses, you know, your own evaluative process for problem solving and creating tools and, and things and tasks and management, looking at rubrics works, creating your own set of expectations also works because you know yourself best. And, um, and so um, that leads us to um, collaboration. And there's a study that I actually cite at the end of this, um, of this presentation that talks about the distribution of labor and productivity and innovation and collaborative sciences. And in many you know, uh, collaborations, you need to have a serendipitous interaction between contrib contributors. It's important, it's crucial to the scientific process. So one of the things I'm gonna mention is that you're gonna have to have a lot of communication and a lot of exchange. And, um, and it's important for uh, participants to have occasional um, you know, occasional check-ins, uh, share your progress with your partners. This has been so important. Um, check in with yourself, set reminders, check in with collaborators, see how your teams are, create a, 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 a server to discuss things, you know, a specific chat or server or collaborative document or Microsoft Teams channel a space where you can always depend on each other. And one of the, um, one of the apps that I use is the WhatsApp um, app. And that's been really helpful, especially for international collaborations. And um, it also enables uh, sharing uh, files and all kinds of things. So that's been a really great way to keep up with, um, you know, it's not an email, it's not a Zoom meeting, but it's just an informal like nudge, like, how's it going? How are you? What is what is it that you're working on? And how how is it that, how much more time are we gonna need to achieve our goal? And I think being informal is important because we're all human. We all have so much going on. It's not just the collaboration, it is everything that you have. And then we have personas outside of, you know, what we do for a living. So thinking about that is important and then tracking progress. I tell my students all the time, track progress, even if it means um, putting a few notes together in the committees that I'm in, um, some of the committees I've led, 
we have been very effective in just keeping an ongoing list of progress bullet points in an, in a never ending uh, Google document. It's been so helpful because you can see the goals at the bottom of the page, you know, what it is that we started with, and then it just flows all the way to the top until it, you know, until you're at the current goal. And it really has been helpful. And again, I've said it a lot, but evaluation is so important in collaboration. Uh, evaluate each other, give each other constructive criticisms. It is an outburst. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a give and take. It's so important to have that. And then another thing I was going to mention is write a blog. A blog is a great way to do it. Um, not, everyone, not everybody likes it, but there are some ways to creatively uh, exchange ideas. There's also really great social communities on social media that um, focus on uh, peer, peer um, collaborations and being a support system and they're interdisciplinary. And I've actually joined a few of those and they've been really helpful, um, especially at all stages of careers. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're just starting or if you're in your 30th, 40th year in the profession. I think that it's it's just important to have some kind of community um, to be reflective and um, to be able to accomplish these things. It really does make the difference. So again, looking at how to maintain productivity, especially through collaboration, and even in your team at work, when you're working with other fellow librarians and other uh, assistants and everybody else that's working with you in your departments, interdepartment collaborations, trust is really important. Being able to rely on one another, being able to rely on yourself. It's so important to rely on you but also on others. It's how you build these relationships and how you make things function and work. And here you have a hierarchy of, of uh, trust. And you're looking at yourself as you know, your visible self. You wanna participate. You wanna share what you know. You wanna find and discover people. You wanna connect and relate, contribute, form a team, coordinate and act. Action is really important. When it comes to productivity, it's all about action. Um, but you have to have that goal so you can actualize it. And then finally, um, the way, so this is just speaking out to everyone in the information profession, thinking about trust and how we trust our, uh, the trust relationships when we are working with our library patrons, you have your library to patron trust, you have your library to library trust, patron to patron, and then patron to library. Similar to these types of um, degrees of trust, it's also going to dictate how you're able to keep up with your own um, projects and plans and goals that you're trying to achieve. So reliability is really, really important. Accountability, reliability. You have tools in between, lots of tools to use. It's difficult to say what tool would work best for you, especially with the different types of modes that were exposed. It really comes down to what can be something that you can take with you, can you, you know, or, or have with you at all times? Can it be something that is a notebook? Can it be something that it is a sticky note? Can it be a reminder? Can it be a calendar item that pops up? I think these are really important things to think about. Finally, I'm wrapping up here thinking about how can we achieve productivity? And it really starts with that path, creating that path to accountability, planning ahead. The tools that I've mentioned, um, you have different applications, you have productivity, um, you know, in, information managers that really help you with your projects. Um, I've mentioned Outlook calendars, I've mentioned setting alarms, I've mentioned using uh, blogs, I've mentioned using um, multiple sets of communication, uh, communicative uh, work doc working documents, but also there are tools like the ones we're using here for communication. There's Zoom, there's Teams. There's also uh, um, other uh, two free platforms out there that really help team building and working in different settings. Um, there are story maps that help you set up the way that you are um, producing material and it, it it really has been helpful. I just started using story maps and um, I think it's a really great tool as well. And um, so 
Tools are important to help, to, to help shape your path. I think that is really important. And then finally, staying productive when engaging in collaboration means you have to share updates, you have to communicate, you have to check in, and you have to rely on each other. And that's really important because your team is really who is going to help you be at the best productivity at the best level. And, um, and it's important to have an equal exchange of feedback amongst each other. I think that um, feedback and stories, they go hand in hand. Um, being able to have that support system is extremely valuable. And just these are some references that I mentioned today that look at evaluating productivity within information systems and management. Um, I also have found um, some other articles related to research productivity in the field that is real, you know, for those who want to uh, take a look at those, these are here too. And um, a little bit more about productivity and innovation, which I mentioned in the beginning as in a business model, um, measuring productivity is really important at, at that type of level, especially in our own profession, and then creating support networks, this last one here, especially for students is so important when they're studying in upper division levels. Um, but if you have any questions about any of the different uh, areas that I covered today, please feel free to email me at Vanessa Reyes at usf.edu. And um, Griselle, Thank you so much, and the uh, you know for this panel, I um, so excited to um, be a part of this. Do you have any questions for me? I don't have any questions, but thank you so very much for sharing all of your insight. I love how you tied it back to personas, especially the idea that you know this goes above and beyond just the work you do in your professional capacity or or as a student. It goes into your life. It goes. It just trickles in and and keeping accountable of all your different parts makes such a big difference when it comes to actually achieving your goals. So I think this is great mm -hmm. advice. And I hope that everybody gets a lot of valuable information out of this. And thank you once again for sharing with us. Um, thank so you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And um, I'm excited to see the other panelists uh, responses as well. I think everyone's going to get a lot of good information out of this session. So thank you once oh, again. Yes. And thank you. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.